Hello and welcome to episode 427 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fan's weekly podcast of many topics. I'm Mike Solosi. And uh, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends, we all have um, played Dark Souls, maybe for the first time, maybe for the fourth time. It, it doesn't matter. We're, it, the game is behind us, and now we are going to talk about everything in the second half of Dark Souls that we care to within a reasonable time frame, um, including story, lore, uh, boss fights, disappointments, what have you. But who's joining me on this journey? The same group as last week. They are Alex Franchek. Hello. Ben Love. Hey. Dom Kim. Hello. And Geo Cassidy. Hello. Geo, Dom, Ben, Alex. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this in the previous episode, but I um, started this game early in t- anticipation that maybe I would really struggle through it to uh, like before we had to record the podcast in time. But I had so mm. much fun that I knocked it out in a couple of weeks and finished the, and finished it like almost a month ago because I mean, this game is just really, really good and gets more compelling the deeper you get in. Uh, and I, and I'm sure I communicated some of that enthusiasm last week, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about the end game um, we, where we cut off last time was at the top of an Orlando um, after the rather notorious Ornstein and Smau fight. Um, you meet a uh, lady. Is it, is it Guinevere? Yeah, okay, you meet Lady Guinevere, a big shiny uh, goddess with, uh, you know, and some impressive, uh, a very statuesque goddess, let's say, uh, at the at the top of an Arlondo. And she uh, gives you the Lord Vessel, which is a, um, uh, I mean, which is some kind of like urn or, uh, or maybe a bowl <laughs> that's uh, specifically for collecting Lord Souls. And to, to reach the first flame and discover your destiny... You need to fill that Lord vessel with four, with uh, I guess three Lord souls, and um, scattered throughout the game are uh, four bosses that have either that Lord soul that you need or a fragment of a Lord soul. The the story sort of explains uh, why those are those circumstances, and uh, the the second half of Dark Souls is getting to those four bosses and then uh, and then using the Lord vessel to challenge the final boss but more importantly the lord vessel also acts as your fast travel device and now um i don't think you can go to every bonfire in the game but something like two-thirds of them become fast travel hubs for you uh once you have the lord vessel um but but uh did we talk about uh the 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 fire keeper at fire lake shrine yeah we did yeah we We did did. yeah I, i think after you ring the second bell she disappears and in An Orlando, you can um, you can challenge that that oh, who's that jerk that has, that brings two friends with him? Uh, Lautrec. 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 Yeah, Lautrec. Lautrec. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Good old Toulouse Lautrec. The uh, the <laughs> the what, what was he like a like a turn of the century mural artist or something? Um, you can fight Lautrec to get that uh, that firekeeper's soul back. Uh, but um, but the the Firelink Shrine isn't a uh, fast travel point on your lord vessel unless you return that firekeeper soul to the uh to the shrine and i want to talk about firekeeper souls later but um in a way this is when uh this point of the game is where dark souls opens up but uh, but also i think this is where dark souls gets a little less interesting just because i think the second half environments aren't quite as well as well plotted or paced as the first half environments. And that's, and that's not an original thought. I mean, I've, I've seen that kind of sentiment pop around everywhere, including from the four of you off air, but uh, without getting into ultra specifics, um, what are our feelings on the, on this, this sort of second part of the game? Yeah. So we, we spent a lot of time talking last time about like the interconnectedness of the world and this, you know, second half of the game kind of loses a lot of that. Yeah, and I think they, they basically four yeah four golden doors that sealed off parts of the world to you are are now gone. So you can explore f- at like four specific places a little bit more deeply now. But other but otherwise, I mean, it's it's a little bit more retreading and revisiting, and less and less discovery, less um feeling the interconnectedness. Yeah, and these areas are also just more like straightforward. I would say like just a little more linear and um. 
and all that, which kind of makes sense because they're kind of the, the end points of each respective branch that's kind of off of Firelink Shrine, but um, you're just not getting that kind of things wrapping in around on themselves as much as you are as you were at the beginning of the game. Yeah, I mean, um, Lost Isolith and the uh, and the Tomb of the Giants are basically two very, very low points um, coming off of Firelink. And uh, the Duke's Archive, I mean, if you think of Anarlondo as just being far, far above Firelink, that's just kind of going up, isn't it? And mm-hmm. the new Londo Ruins are sort of like directly below without without stretching as far away as uh, the, as um, Lost Isolith or Tomb of the Giants. But, but generally, I, I agree. These are less interesting areas than before. And most of them have gimmicks that I just find annoying. I'm sure all of us have tripped and fallen to one of those um, like one of those on fours skeleton giants in the tomb of the giants <laughs> yeah. and fallen off a ledge before. Yeah. Um, that, and like... then there's the, uh, invisible, um, sections in the, uh, I, I think it's in the crystal cave. Yeah. The crystal right? cave. Yeah. yeah. You, you have to, you have to watch and see where the raindrops are falling to find out where the invisible bridges are. And, um, I know that made me think of that one scene from Indiana Jones and the last crusade a little bit, but, uh, yeah, that that was a little annoying too. And um and the, the boss fights are I I mean they're not bad, but I feel like all of them like well uh okay, one of them's bad. You, you, but uh, none of them are as cool or satisfying as um as Ornstein and Smau or or even like the uh the uh the Bell Tower gargoyles. But but I mean I I don't want to to sound like I'm just I'm I the, the second half's a downer. It, like it's still good. I definitely liked fighting these bosses and getting stronger and getting to the end game. It's just not as powerfully like cool as the, as the first half. Um, uh, Dom, what's your memory of the second half of dark souls one? Like, I mean, it's pretty much as you described here. It's like there, I, for me, at least I can, after Ornstein and Snow, there's like a definite cutoff point. I feel where from softest weren't able to get, um, enough iterations on the levels or just ran out of time to finish the levels because like just <clears throat> going from you know how beautifully laid out Anne Orlando is to then going to Lost Isolith where there are like the dragon butt enemies just like scattered around everywhere or even the demon runes before it where there are just like I don't know like 20 Taurus demons just standing in lava yeah there's there's a, there's a corridor full of Taurus <laughs> demons and a corridor full of Capra demons yeah. And 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 it almost feels like you have to pick your poison. Then you realize, oh, there's there's sort of a way they intend for you to go that avoids most of them. But it's a yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not my favorite yeah. fire dungeon. Let me tell you. Yeah, it's like it, and it's, I mean, it was still fun to. They were still like visually interesting, at least like Lost Isolith, especially. Um, also, recently, I like I looked through Lost Isolith using like a no clip tool, in like a just like on the internet and like the layout and like the visuals of the map itself are like really interesting and well made it's just i feel they weren't able to get gameplay passes on it to really make it interesting to play and i feel that's also really reflective on the boss fight at the end of lost isolith as well yeah i mean i had heard of this boss before playing the game because um people would be like oh man ornstein or small are great but uh bed of chaos is the worst boss in the whole series it's like uh i mean i mean lost Isolith is sort of it uh in case the listeners uh, are unaware or have forgotten the demon ruins are sort of a big fiery zone lost Isolith is a slightly more like like still a big fiery zone that's also kind of a bit of a, a wasteland like it, it's fallen into more disrepair and and uh and and der- a state of dereliction but the end bed of chaos is basically it's a uh, sort of just a a like a fiery cage that where you have to um destroy three sort of lights on it to shut it down so there there's not it, it's not an opponent that we we you know with a sensible health bar you just sort of have to get to each of the three points while mm-hmm. the ground is collapsing around you they're lashing at you with giant uh giant tendrils or roots or something um making uh things fall from the ceiling um it's very very easy to lose your balance and fall and die instantly and the walk back to light lost easelith is a giant pain in the ass even if you unlock the shortcut back to uh uh, uh back to blight town 
So it's a, uh, it, it took me a couple attempts for the bed of chaos, but, uh, okay. and the hardest part was to figure out that for the third light, you have to drop down onto a bridge into one of the holes instead of leaping across or, uh, or finding a path along the side, which I tried a couple times before figuring it out. Um, I mean, is, is the bed, is the bed of chaos as bad as bad for everyone else? Cause it's like, it's, it's, it's different from every fight in the game, but not in a fun way. Yeah, I mean it's it's extremely tedious. Like it starts off like like a joke. Like you're just like walking and you're like, oh okay, I guess I like go to either the left or right side, and I just like break this thing, and then like the ground starts crumbling, and you're like, oh, this is kind of annoying. And if you're running, which if you're doing it for the first time, you're like, why wouldn't I run? Um, you can like easily just run into like a pit as it's crumbling beneath your feet. And then suddenly that's a restart and then that can just like keep happening. And then like the stupid tree root thing just starts swiping at you. You have to make that horrible jump onto that, that mm. trunk br uh, bridge you mentioned. And then you finally get to the end and just like, okay. And you walk down like this little path and it's just like this stupid bug and you one shot it. And then the fight's over. It's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting design, but it's definitely not fun to play. I mean, I mean, I saw a lot of chatter when I was, when I was going through a uh, a a Dark Souls hyper research phase, that is one of the worst bosses in the series, and I see no reason to uh, to deny that. Yeah, I think one of the the most apt descriptions I've seen is they they put a Mario boss with Dark Souls controls, and that's what the bed of chaos is. And I kind of agree. You, you like Dark Souls still? It's still in the phase where you have to like sprint and then t click the left stick to jump. And like you have to do like platforming segments and avoid holes that you have no idea are going to appear when you're doing it for the first time. And it's just it's just a hot mess, really. It's a it's learning through repetition in like the worst way possible because you're just forced to fail until you just can see the patterns or just know where the holes are going to appear or how the arms are going to sweep across the arena. Like there's no way for you to, I think, to realistically beat the boss in one go just using the cues that the boss gives you during the fight yeah i've never met a single player who was just like oh no yeah i figured it out like it was easy yeah. like no everybody just gets surprised and frustrated and annoyed so that's why it has such a terrible reputation i mean i mean rather than a mario boss because there's the glowing weak points that you have to hit it reminds me more like a shadow of the colossus boss but worse than every single shadow of the colossus boss mm. it, it, it's like you know, like um run from weak point to weak point and, and the and the 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 ending is underwhelming the um it's a little sort of firefly looking bug behind the behind the cage that drops the lord soul and um i'd, I'd like to take a break from go, talking about boss battles to get into story stuff a little bit um the lore that's or not even the lore the opening cutscene of the game talks about how this land lordran is named after the lords that uh that 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 liberated the land from a from a civilization of of dragons, and each one of those four uh, had a powerful lord soul that gave them immortality and great power. And uh, uh, the way that this game does storytelling is is well documented, and it's it's very very cool when they pull it off well, and they and they off and FromSoft often does, but you don't like like you kind of play can play this game as a meathead knight just going from place to place and ring defeating bosses and ringing bells and collecting souls and not really pay attention to what you're doing but uh if you do things like take the souls from enemies as you uh the, from the bosses make weapons with them uh by going to andre or the giant <laughs> oh andre the giant <laughs> neither neither of them is andre the giant um and like but and read the weapon descriptions and just Take in all of the uh, minimalist storytelling that they give you, lets you sort of realize what happened before, and that you're sort of navigating this ru this ruined world that was once prosperous but is now in like the the late stages of its life. And I mean, we talked about that a little bit last time, but um, the thing, the thing, the point I wanted to make was. Um, uh Quellag, the boss at the end of Blight Town, is a um a fiery uh lady with um with the lower half of a spider. And um uh and uh oh boy, what's that disgusting name of the boss in the demon ruins? 
ceaseless discharge. Yeah, yeah the ceaseless discharge. <laughs> and um, Quelag's sister, a similar spider woman, um, who is uh, located uh, in like the room behind her, but but she's a a firekeeper that actually lets you join her cult, as it were. Um, it, like if you um make weapons from the ceaseless discharge soul and the and uh and Quelag soul and and read around and like find stuff around Blight Town, you realize that that um one of the Lord souls from that opening cutscene went to sort of the uh the witch queen. And the witch and this witch and her children, um, when the the first flame that was sustaining the world was starting to 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 flicker, they tried to make an artificial flame using magic rituals to allow the world to be saved again. But the ritual went extremely bad. The uh, the the town that they sort of um, lived in uh, com- was completely warped. And I think Blight Town, the Demon Ruins, and Lost Isolith are the ruins of the of the city they used to live in. Um, like and the blight town half of it was corrupted by poison the demon ruins half of it was corrupted by fire and uh the the witch became this bugs trapped in the bed of chaos two of her children became the 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 two spider women in blight town and her son became the rather grotesque ceaseless discharge boss but you only can glean that by finding a lot of equipment forging a lot of weird soul equipment reading the 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 uh um, descriptions, putting the puzzle pieces together, or if you're like me, you read w- two Wikipedia wiki articles and watched a video. But still, the the fact that the seeds for all of this are there, and um, it, and it's a dark, tragic story that has physical evidence in the game for it is it's it's really cool once you get it. Or maybe if you're playing the game for the second time, maybe you already know it, but now you're playing it and in the moment understanding it better. Um. Now, I, I this is, might be unfair of me, but but if you guys can try to transport yourself to the first time you played this game, like how aware of this lore were you playing? Let, let's say the uh, the Blight Town and um and Los Angeles sequences. Like how aware of all the story were you when you first played it? And maybe did you were you like me and you learned about it later and then sort of under and sort of felt different about it afterwards? Because I, I it's a it's a really cool feeling when when you sort of like get the lore and see it play out. Yeah, I think um, I mean, I think it, it would be really hard for someone to like actually fully experience the story just playing through it. Like it almost requires that you. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Have outside stuff or people like kind of t- putting the pieces together for you. But I think that the. Um, like environmental storytelling is very strong and that I think it part of why it works so well is like you, you notice or see all these things when you're playing through the game and these environments and, and there's little details or things that stand out to you. And you're like, huh, like, I wonder what that is. And then when you go to look for explanations later, then you already have experience with all the pieces and then just having them fit together is like very satisfying so I, I think that's part of why, like, there's so much appeal behind, like, lore explanation for the series, because it, it's a whole cottage industry of its in itself. I know I mentioned yeah. it before, but there are YouTube documentary series, dedicated podcasts, probably a, a zillion online think pieces. It is it, it's not hard to find a good lore explainer for these games out there, but it's yeah, but, it's I, all, but, I, but, but the lore is also cool. So I get it. Yeah. And I think, too, it's like it's not just that, like. Like, I think if if it was all just in, like, item descriptions or if it was all, like, really obscure or hidden through, like, the character quests that are kind of hard to to complete on your first time through, then I think people just wouldn't, like, care as much about it. But I think the the fact that people are so hungry for those explanations is kind of proof that the little things that they pepper throughout the environments and that NPCs will tell you and things like that are really compelling. And that's why so many people like want to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And it's also like the, the obtuseness like present on the game and like kind of like a mechanical level then just also translates to the way you experience the story. So there's, there's a real like internal consistency to the way you like experience the game on all levels, which is, which is super interesting. Like the first time I played it, I, I didn't even really know, like I hadn't heard about like the way that the story is is supposed to work in the game. So I I wasn't really reading item descriptions. I didn't know I was kind of expected to. I didn't know like the degree of story that's expressed through them. So I was just kind of like 
fumbling my way through the world, just enjoying the atmosphere and like using like demon runes as an example, like I pulled up there and like, it's just like this massive, like almost agoraphobic open space with just like a bunch of like boss demons spread through it. And I'm like, Oh, this, this area looks unfinished. But then like, after you like do understand all the lore and like the basic kind of like explosive apocalypse that happened in that area and the way like demons were unleashed from the chaos flame you're just like oh that that adds like so much more character to the way this environment is designed even though it's like not it's probably the worst environment like to explore from like a gameplay angle but it does sort of like impart this new sense of like meaning onto the space you're walking through that's that's just really interesting and and adds a lot of character to the game I mean, I, I know that uh, this won't work for everyone because, again, I'm I am maybe the least concerned about spoilers of anyone that I know, or, or let's say me and my sister are tied. <laughs> uh, she, um, she was a, a movie critic that worked for uh, uh, Entertainment Weekly and a couple other places for many years. Um, but like, like w- the way I experienced the game was, I, I played it when I found something interesting or wanted to look something up, like even just where where to find the Titanite sl- uh, large chunks or something. Um, I would I would go and watch a video or read a, a wiki article to, to figure it out, and then I would get caught up and start reading more wiki articles. So I I experienced a lot of the story <laughs> by reading about the game and watching things about the game while I was in the middle of playing it, which is not an ideal way to experience it for most people. But like uh, this this wasn't true of every single area. But like going through I mean let's say Lost Isleth as an example again, going through there for the first time, I'm like oh this is this is the heart of where the witches were and uh, and like, like sort of seeing it having read about it ahead of time was, was still very fun just because the uh, like the environments are so thoughtfully designed and the lore is so cool. Um, but we've been using that part of the game as an example uh, uh, as uh, Gio or, or, uh, or, or Ben or Dom. Um, was there a part of the game where you sort of had, that, that that was just the the perfect meeting of exploring and storytelling for you that where it just it just sort of hit you how the game was presenting itself to you and it just and it was enhanced as a result maybe that's an awkward way to phrase the question but jump around anywhere you want yeah i mean i think um when you go to new londo after um the water's been like drained out and then you're there and there's like all the the bodies at the bottom that were mm-hmm. under all of that um, I thought that was like a really interesting, like, and kind of like freaky, um, uh, piece of element of, uh, of environmental storytelling, right? Cause it's, it's, you know, you, you finally get to this, this area. And if you'd gone there earlier, like it's very, you know, there's a curse in it, me, ghost enemies or whatever. And it's very like foreboding. And then to get there and then see like the, the ramifications of what happened to them is just like, I think very like impactful, um, so that, that's, that's what comes to mind when, when I think of, of like the story and the exploration and gameplay kind of meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it was the, it was also that New London Ruins, but it was also the Duke's archives because like, there's a part of the Duke's archives where, um, you encounter like these, um, uh, snake enemies, but they have like octopus heads or something. And you're like wondering what's up with them and then like um you can actually like make them do something if you like ring a bell in the building and if you kill two of there's like two um two of them who aren't really hostile to you and then when you kill them like they drop like a a miracle that's like given the guinevere's maidens and it's like it's like oh i understood like oh from software is trying to tell me something and like i remembered that um the scales has been like abducting maidens uh and doing experiments on them so i was like oh so this is the result and i found that really cool that it was not really like told to me and it was not like ex- it wasn't like delivered through exposition but like um through something like you just like, kind of encounter and you kind of have to go out of your way to to find that out so I found that really cool. Yeah, and and as you're like killing like all those like more aggressive squid head people, like it's just like two of them are just kind of in the corner of the cell and like as you approach them you hear like 
just sounds of like women sobbing even though they're just like these sitting squid things and then yeah you kill them and you, you get those miracles so yeah it, it's quite a quite a good combination of like also how the game uses like sound to support like the storytelling and then yeah getting the miracles and reading those descriptions is just even more developing yeah <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I think um, Dark Crew, I mean, I, I, I agree with all the areas mentioned here, but I also think um, Dark Crew Garden was such a, was such a, <clears throat> such like a different vibe of ex exploration up to that point, with like the castles and everything was still like pretty well lit. And it was, it was st sort of standard, um, sort of castle, um, how do you call it? Like landscapes at that point but dark root garden for us for me was such like first of all like most of it is sealed off behind a behind a crest that you have to get from andre and just exploring the area finding the trees um finding like the stone golems scattered around which are also really freaking hard to kill by the way and then finishing the area off with the the moonlight butterfly boss fight which isn't hard by any means but it's like the ost the whole vibe it was just like for me it was i think it was definitely one of the most like atmospheric and most um engaging areas to explore and just like try and figure out like more about like what happened here why why are these trees alive even i don't think is that even Ex explained in the game i'm not sure but still the whole like mystical feeling of dark souls i feel is really well like encapsulated in the dark root gardens and, and also towards the back end of dark root gardens you fight the um uh you fight those forest hunter human-sized enemies or you have you have to mm -hmm. navigate part of the woods with these the, again the these um human-sized hunters that you that can be a little difficult if you uh if you're fighting more than one at a time but then partway through that zone, you f meet a talking cat. <laughs> and if you join, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, if you join the covenant of the forest hunters, they stop attacking you and you can get some bonuses and items for uh, invading other players spaces using the multiplayer uh, functionality. But yeah, the dark root garden, um, the, the talking cat, the trees, the, uh, the open areas, including the basin, at one end of the garden that, uh, that also connects a bunch of other places in the game. Like I think you, there, there's a path to the, uh, um, Oh, what's, what's the, uh, the, the Valley of Drakes. Yeah. The, 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 there's a connection path to Valley of Drakes, which is these narrow bridges and cliffs that connect several areas together. And I think another one is a path, uh, that's like another shortcut to blight town or something. It, 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 it it's a very different feeling area that also enhances that feeling of interconnectedness that the game has. But maybe most importantly, I, one of my favorite boss fights from a story perspective is in Dark Root Garden. Um, you, you fight Seif the uh, uh, the wolf there, which is a uh, a wolf that's guarding the tomb of uh, of of the of the Knight Artorius, and uh, it it it's. I, I don't know if it's very clearly explained beforehand, but it, you can sort of it's you realize sort of a, afterwards that Artorius is again like a great hero of legend in this world, and uh, Seif was his canine companion who's still guarding his tomb to this day, and you fight Seif who who has who wields Artorius's great sword in her mouth. Um, it, it's not a challenging or or particularly memorable boss fight mechanically, but. After you defeat Seif and you get Artorius's ring from his uh, from his grave, you realize that like just out of out of out of a feeling of loss or or a feeling of guilt that she couldn't save him, Seif had just been loyally guarding that gravestone, like you know, like 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 the Hachiko statue in to in uh, in Shibuya in Tokyo or something. It was um it, it it's it's a, a boss fight that's sort of sad in retrospect. But you need Artorius's ring to um, get one of those Lord Souls, uh, so it's a uh, yeah. There's there's no avoiding it. Yeah, I kind of yeah, resent the game oh. for making me kill uh, Artorius's good good girl. Yeah, I didn't like that. <laughs> I wish it was optional. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean that that's definitely not optional because otherwise, by setting foot in in the deepest part of uh, of New Londo, you instantly die, right? Yeah. Yeah, you need it. Yeah. I wish you could just like but pet Sif and then like she'd like <laughs> give it to you. <laughs> 
you do get to save her in the DLC, though. That that's a little bit of uh, redemption on the developers. That's part. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll get there soon. But um, that that leads me to one other thing that I that I think is interesting. You you can do the Sieve boss fight and at least part of the um, New Londo ruins before uh, finishing Anor Londo. So like you, like you can do all that without the Lord Vessel and um, fast traveling. Although I not I don't necessarily recommend that because fast travel is a is a major, major uh, uh, breath of uh, like a sigh of relief in this game. But um, th- there's a, a serpent named Frampt that uh, joins the Firelink Shrine. I think after you've rung one of the bells, either the one in, in the Undead Parish or the one in Blight Town, and he explains to you that, uh, that someday one of the undeads gathering here is going to become the chosen undead and gather and gather the lord uh, the souls into the lord vessel and and relight a flame that will revive the world again but there's also a second serpent named i think kata and i didn't or or kath maybe i didn't actually meet kath because i just sort of did what Frampt told me to do but if you get, if you get um deep into the new londo ruins before getting the lord vessel um, you can meet a second serpent who says that um, uh, relighting the first flame is not necessarily the goal here uh, because the, the way the way again I only saw a video of this I didn't actually meet Katha because because I because I basically sided with Frampt I think Katha was gone before I really had a chance to meet him yeah. but the, the, this yeah, other it's between one or the other yeah you can't you can't um you know accept um framps like thing and it's like when you place the lord vessel that's what right so if I, it. you have to bring the lord Vess- vessel to new londo okay okay first. so I, so it, it, but still i mean new londo is considerably um out of the way compared to compared to Frampt and anor londo because like like the the story really directs you towards anor londo and Frampt is right there in your sort of home base area well, Koth is in this pretty out of the way, deep underground zone that I didn't even really start to explore until after I got the Lord Vessel. So it's it's very out of the way. But uh, but Koth down there lets you join a new covenant, which is which are kind of like guilds in this game. Uh, but also um, tell you that b- basically there was the um, the the uh, now now I, I could be getting the names of this wrong. Um, there was the uh, the, the the ancient age, which was the the time where the, where the dragons ruled everything, and then the uh, after the four lords defeated the dragons, the world entered the fire age, where it was sort of um, sustained by the by the first flame, and and there was a new level of prosperity. But we're in the late the end of the fire age now, and but Kathis suggests that the 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 best way to save the world is not to continue the fire age, but to let the flame go out. And rule over the world in an age of darkness. And well, yeah, um, and it's it's not even like saving the world. He's like particularly like appealing to you as a human, and and saying that the gods have basically like oppressed humanity, and so like by ushering in the age of darkness, you like stop the cycle of Gwyn's age of fire and like let humanity truly prosper. But it's highly, highly suspect. Like the theory he's trying it, to get you yeah, to it, into. It's it's very suspect. But I think that um Frampt's uh uh version of events is also suspect because Frampt oh, yeah. it clearly supports the order of gods that ruled um d- during the fi- the the fire age or age age of uh fire. I'm not I, I could be getting my nomenclature wrong. And and again, a lot of this comes from me doing research outside of the text of the game. But uh, the four souls that ended the Age of Dragons were uh, the Sun God, the Sun King Gwyn, the, uh, the, the Grave Lord Nito, the, 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 Witch, Queen, the Witch Queen that I uh, mentioned before, and then a fourth soul that was, uh, that, that was um, basically the ancestor of humanity. Uh, it's something called, like, uh, called the Pygmy. But, uh, but, Th- that that fourth soul really worried Gwyn because Gwyn didn't didn't trust hu- uh, humanity like th- th- he saw human humanity's like giant potential but also felt threatened by it sort of big Cronus uh, swallowing his children kind of en- en- uh, energy 
So Gwyn placed a curse on the humans of Lordran that any uh, now I, I could be wrong about this and because I again I, I I I've done a lot of research but not every but I could be getting details wrong that um <clears throat> humans in Lordran are cursed to become undeads and uh in, in which case if a human dies they will be revived at a, at the at a bonfire but if they lose their sense of self or lose their purpose or or, or give in to despair then they become hol um, hollowed undeads basically mind mindless ones that will just attack until they can't move anymore and the humans that you meet in this game like some of them are just trying to avoid hollowification like that that night that you talked to in the firelink uh, shrine for the first time is just sort of, sort of just really dejected i think he might even be be called like the sullen knight or the dejected knight or something and uh, uh after you get the lord vessel he's gone but if you go, you encounter a, a, an undead in that exact same armor in uh, uh near the new londo ruins later so it's so like so at some point the dejected knight just sort of gave in to despair and uh and lost his sense of self so but but that curse on humanity is um is because like like gwyn the sun king felt threatened by the that the lord's soul shared between all of humanity but koth sees that Lord soul in you and says, Hey, if you usher in a new age of darkness that will truly excise the world of the influence of those, of those uh, Lords from before and be a true age for humans. But I mean, Koth is definitely being a suspect. This is, I, I, I don't, I do not think he's trustworthy, but if you're able to encounter Koth, which is not a guarantee um, before, you know, finding Frampt and giving the Lord vessel to him, that at least gives you a second, a, a second, or an idea for a second path, or at least talking about what ends up being the game's second ending. I didn't do any of that. I mean, I talked to Frampt. Frampt told me to go to An Orlando and bring him the Lord Vessel. I did exactly that, <laughs> and uh, and just sort of continued the game, uh, just sort of doing what I was told. But it's kind of cool that there's this hidden second way that gives you maybe a, a a darker more bleak ending that has but but with uh that that's more pro human and less pro lordran i mean i mean am i am i getting any important details off or but uh, are you, but yes or no to that like what, what do we feel about the uh the different story paths in this game um yeah i, I feel like koth is a like a conspiracy grifter and Gwyn mm -hmm. and his whole kingdom is like big government <laughs> and like so when you go to Koth and he's just like telling you like the way you're being like exploited basically like there's there's a nice ring of truth to it and like it's it's uh, a theory you kind of like almost want to buy into but then there's just like all of these clues about like the way that darkness like just corrupts and destroys and even like humanoid type beings like just cannot thrive in it and become like kind of deformed as we'll kind of see in the dlc so yeah th th that's my read on it at least yeah uh i think uh i'm not sure if gwyn is the cause of the curse because he himself goes hollow i'm pretty sure like you fight a hollow fight gwyn at the end but um I'm, I'm not really sure where the curse comes from i think it's like part of the, the decay of the Age of Fire. And like, it's essentially like inevitable that it's going to end. And it's like, you either choose to ex prolong it or you choose to um, uh, usher in a new age, whatever it is like Koth wants to do. And I think it's actually interesting because, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate online, but like, we don't really know if, um, uh, Frampt and Koth are really like opposed to each other because at the end of the second ending, you kind of see like a whole bunch of um, primordial serpents like greet you and say pledge to serve you as the like, new king or something. And my, yeah. my, my read on it is that um, the primordial serpents are something older and, <clears throat> and, and more knowledgeable than anything else in the world. But Frampt was sort of the one that support that supported Gwyn, and Koth was one that does not support Gwyn. 
and and maybe craves an age of darkness. But you know, the more you think about it, I, I think that uh, the more I think about it, um, it probably is Koth propaganda that uh, the idea that Gwyn created the curse, for, for probably to, to turn you against Gwyn. Yeah. Um, the, the likelier answer is that the the first flame ignited by Gwyn, um, as it as it dwindles, it it probably uh, like like the, the curse just sort of appeared in the world as as a symptom of the of the world dying sort of mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not even sure if lighting the flame um excises the curse but uh but but yeah you're i mean the, i mean we're uh, jumping around a little bit but the final boss of the game is a hollowed gwyn and um um and and the choice at the end is do you sacrifice your life to uh ignite the first flame and and revive lordran to a degree or do you just walk past the the first flame and allow it to go out, and uh, you get that scene with the the serpents all bowing to you. Yeah, I, I I lit the flame. I just I just decided, you know what? I'm I'm I've been sort of playing this game normally, even though I've read a bunch of lore. Uh, this this is just kind of what I want. If, if I replay the game in the future, I can I can go the uh, the 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 dark route. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, did, did anyone else um uh, decide to um to let the flame die this time around? Oh, I did that this time. And you don't even need to meet Koth to do that. You can just kind of walk out. <laughs> and you, you'd probably be really confused if you didn't know you could do that. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can actually do You're it. like, what's with all these snakes? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, wh why are there dozens of frampts now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually... No, I, I sorry. always... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, I was just going to say, like, it's, it's really interesting because, like... Um, uh, Dark Souls 3 kind of picks up on the first ending where you kind of let the flame continue. So I really wonder what would have happened to the world if this, after the second ending, I guess. I'm very curious about that. I mean, given what we know, I think it's pretty clear that the first ending was chosen because uh, Dark Souls 3 takes place in in Lordran long after the events of Dark Souls one, so uh, but 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 maybe this gives you I I I haven't played Dark Souls three I don't know that game but that but that either maybe gives you a chance to a second chance to end the cycle of suffering or probably more accurately just a new conflict has arisen in Lordran. We'll but uh, it, it, this isn't a Dark Souls three podcast. I'm 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 speculating on a game that's already been out for eight years or something. So this, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But 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 yeah, like they they at least give you a lot of lore to uncover and some and some interesting questions to address uh, for the end game. But uh, but be before we get there, uh, is there anything else in the second half of the game that we really want to talk about? I mean, the the tomb of the giants just sucks. It's dark. You need to either hold a skull lantern or wear a, a bright light on your head to properly get around. Um, I kind of like it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's cool until I have to, until I'm confronted with actually having to navigate it, and, and at which point <laughs> it is no longer cool and it's annoying, and I want to be done with it. Um, we talked about the invisible floors in the crystal cave. That's a cool effect. Uh, the, the Duke's archives is a pretty is a pretty interesting library dungeon where you have to manipulate some switches and, and staircases to, uh, to 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 get out of wh what you're doing in there. Um, but you know, we we talked about humans going hollow and how there are some uh, some NPCs that you interact in, with in the game, like the dejected knight and low trek. But uh, there's two we haven't really mentioned yet. Uh, maybe I think we maybe we mentioned Solaire a little bit in the previous episode. But they they have at least in my feeling uh, two of the bigger optional quests in the game. Um, I mean, I mean, but but also Solaire is per probably the most positively tinged character in this entire game. Like, I mean, I know he's a, he's a knight that worships the sun, but he is literally a ray of sunshine. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, we we, we love Solaire. Is it, and are there any Solaire haters here? Because if if so, you this might be your last episode of Retro Encounter. I mean, he's he's <laughs> literally like my my profile image on RPG fans. So I'm I'm a, quite a fan of Solaire. Um, I just like. Even that first encounter with him where he's just like staring like boldly and warmly at the sun on that like balcony in the undead berg is just like that that image is just like burnt into my head from the first time I play the game and then you you talk to him and he's just like 
so positive and and i love his like equipment descriptions where it's like like first of all his like armor is like it looks like a, a child's drawing of like a sun on it it's pretty great um but then like his sunlight straight sword the, the item description is basically like that oh despite its name it's like it's basically like a long sword and it it, it plays like a long sword as well so this idea that like solaire is just like like kind of like the perfect like player version of like the player character where he just like has like all this faith in like Gwyn and the sun and wants to like keep like that age going and he just like basically is is just purely like skilled like there's nothing like fancy about his equipment he just like puts a lot of like heart into it um it's just like he, he's such a great character and and the fact that if you do his quest line um all the right way and it's it's probably like maybe the most convoluted quest line to get done i that, like, i, you can I actually would not i yeah go ahead guys sorry that mm -hmm. you can actually like summon him for like the final fight just like tells me that in a way he's like the game's true hero which i, I think is really cool there's a couple of ways to interpret him um he does have a covenant you can join again which are kind of like guilds that uh i think you either need um you need a very high faith stat to join it but that the faith requirement drops if you go into other people's worlds to help th to help others, and it's it's a covenant that gives you some powerful miracle spells, but also uh, uh, gives you bonuses when you go into uh, worlds to help others. So, like, I, I think the suggestion is Solaire is a visitor from his kingdom who's trying to obtain the first flame to either save Lordran or save his own kingdom, but he is someone that helps others first, and even his multiplayer mechanics. Uh, communicate that you can summon Solaire for a couple fights, not just the f final fight. Um, I, I I brought him into that uh, the, the dragon in the sewers level, uh, the the gaping maw dragon or something. I, I forget its name. I'm sorry. I, I, again, I played this game a month ago. Uh, I think it's but, gaping dragon. Yeah, yeah, gaping dragon. That's it. Um, but 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 he he's so positive. He and um, I I only found out how his quest worked. When I after I encountered him, pro I think probably for the sec for like the third time, like in Orlando, um, when he's uh, by one of the bonfires partway through the the castle, I was look I was reading about him, and they're like, "There's like there's a here's the how you save Solaire, and here's what happens to kill Solaire." And I'm like, "Oh no, I I, I want to save Solaire. What what do I got to do?" And uh, what you have to do is, um, the 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 the, the spider woman firekeeper at the end of blight town who who's slightly hidden herself. So I think she's behind a hidden wall that you can like hear noises behind. Um, uh, you have to join her covenant, which, and then give her 30 humanity. And again, humanity is a replenishing resource that you get by, I think killing um, between 10 and 20 enemies without dying. How lets you build humanity slowly you can also use humanity items to um, gain some instantly. Uh, you can spend humanity to kindle a, a, a bonfire and uh, to um, give you more um, more shots on your ex Estus flask. Uh, there, there's benefits for being human, but you lose all of your humanity um, when you uh, when you're killed, but gain it back if you find your corpse in time. And you can even farm humanity because there's some enemies that drop humanity granting items, so it's it's not a completely uh uh zero sum game resource but but giving 30 uh humanity to the spider woman levels you up in her covenant by uh, from level one to two or something and that unlocks a secret door in the demon ruins and if you go through that secret door uh you you can kill a a parasite bug there that gives you that gives you a helmet that that helps you light the way through the tomb of giants um and and which and also gives you a shortcut to Lost Isolith. But the issue is, if you get to Lost Isolith before, um, uh, w without without getting through that secret passage and and not and killing that bug, then uh, Solaire goes there, gets there before you, and he becomes uh, uh possessed by the parasite bug, believing that um the, this 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 very very brightly shining bug is the sun that he had been seeking. And which drives him mad and you have to kill him in that circumstance. But if you um, find this very convoluted, um, not very well telegraphed way to find this secret passage, 
and kill the bug before so before you get to Lost Isolith for the first time. Then Solaire, you meet Solaire uh, in, in a bonfire near there, but he's kind of dejected because he, I think he's sort of has come to the realization that um, that Gwyn isn't uh, is no longer the Sun King of Legend. That that uh, that Lordran's dying, and he might not be able to find the son he needs ever. So like it, it it ends with Solaire being sad if you save his life, but he is available for that final boss fight as a as a summon. And which just communicates just to how a much of a good person and uh, uh, Solaire is that that wants to be there for you, the uh, the hero that inadvertently saved him. So it, so again, it's it's very convoluted, but you're damn right. I wanted to do it. So I, I farmed humanity for 40 minutes or something by killing rats in the sewer. And then and I and I saved him. But it's uh, it, it, it's, it's just weird. The, the the odd step you have to do to um to get through there but I, I never would have found it on my own i i found it by specifically accidentally like f- seeing how do i save solaire and then reading about it yeah and i think that's one of the really one of the great parts about dark souls as well which has been mentioned a lot um previously as well um it's that the world it really feels like the world doesn't revolve around you as much as you are like the prophesized the chosen undead who will save Lordran. Um the like NPCs really do have their own agendas and they will go through with them regardless of like whatever you're doing. So like they won't be around Firelink forever as like a vendor for spells or whatever. And like just like the act of them moving to different areas, um and then, like, if you talk to them, they'll, like, tell you about, like, what they've been doing till that point. I feel that just lends itself so well to the the environmental storytelling and, like, the natural world building of Dark Souls. And, like, it really did also, like, at least for me, it, like, it really furthered my curiosity in, like, the characters themselves. But also, like, for instance, like, Big Hat Logan, um, he he's, like, a... He's, like, a very famous mage who eventually goes um, crazy in the Duke's archives, I believe. And like he, like you, he's in like a cage in Sen's fortress. And like after you free him, he'll be in like Firelink Shrine for a bit. But he's also on like a quest to find like the, I think what was like the perfect sorceries that Seath was researching and just like stuff like that. And like seeing stuff like that and experiencing stuff like that and even missing stuff like that and like eventually coming back and maybe going through it again with a wiki. Like I feel that just lends itself so well to the, to how alive the world feels in dark souls yeah there's so many hidden things and so many obscurely hidden things like like there's a whole area that we've mentioned a couple times the great hollow that is Mm -hmm. uh that that's behind a hidden wall in a treasure chest at one end at like a a sort of out of the way corner of blight town that's a giant path like a giant tree trunk path down leading to a new uh, zone called ash lake it's extremely hard to find that without some kind of guidance but if you have multiplayer turned on there's definitely a lot of player messages leading you to the great hollow possibly warning you about it like we we mentioned uh at least one of us i forget who i'm sorry getting uh stuck in the great hollow uh without the lord vessel and then having to have and then having a very difficult time navigating your way back up but um like, like this is a big and and going into the multiplayer stuff again if you're playing online which i which i didn't for the most part um like seeing the player hints and messages maybe will guide you just towards some of this very obscurely hidden content but if you're not playing that way then maybe you you play the game a little clumsily at first you let solaire die you you don't uh, meet many of these npcs or find many of these areas but after you beat the game i i think i think i think this is true of most from software uh fantasy rpgs you're immediately dropped into a new game plus and maybe you'll do some more research and more reading and and find out things you missed and then uh, experience the game a new way the next time. And, and uh, there's no wrong way to play these. I'm, I'm not saying you, you should do the research ahead like I mostly did or you should experience it cold once and then and then uh, and then more uh, more deliberately um, um, reading ahead later. But uh, the fact that it's all there for you is just so, so cool. And on top of it, the the action's fun. The the boss fights are mostly really, really good. Some examples like Bed of Chaos notwithstanding. 
Um, I, I didn't think the Nito boss fight was great either. I mean, he's basically just a big hunchback skeleton that yells at you. Uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, it, like navigating the uh, Tomb of the Giants was way harder than fighting Nito for me personally. But but he also was the last of the Lord Souls that I challenged, so I probably was a little over leveled. Um, but before we get into a couple more uh, shenanigans involving Gwendolyn and Priscilla that I, that I would like to talk to you before we wrap, uh, is, there, is there any part of this game, whether it's story or gameplay or even a boss fight or your your personal build related that we want to um, that we want to bring up? Because I mean, I, I I played through once I once I had gotten on Orlando, I sort of settled on the Great Scythe and a uh, and various medium shields. <laughs> For a while, it was the uh, the grass crest shield then it was the silver knight shield and then by the end of the game it was the uh i i had moved on to the great shield of artorias uh i was mostly a scythe and shield black knight for uh the entire second half of the game but is there is there anything we want to talk about before we move on to um gwendolyn priscilla and dlc i mean i guess one thing i'll, I'll bring up that that's always stood out to me as as one of my favorite parts of the game um it's just like the sound design and like all of the the Soul series has like really like detailed sound design uh, that uses like sound effects and just like ambience to give like character to like different environments or like different enemies. But there's something about the like jankiness of the mixing in the sound design in in Demon Souls and Dark Souls in particular. And, and I actually looked this up. I I didn't realize that the the sound director uh, for those two games. Uh, Yuji Takanuchi um, actually didn't do the the sound design for later games, um, which is a lot more like polished and, and professionally done, I think. But there's like that weirdness in the mixing where like like ambience is just like really kind of like subtle in in the background, but then like all like the sounds of like footsteps or like enemy movements are like super forward in the mix. That I think like from the beginning like was a big part of the game's appeal to me and like kind of gave it this like surreal almost like mix mystical character to the world um so yeah I, I just like really appreciate the sound design of this game and I, I think like even though like environments don't get like music the way like they do in like a lot of other rpgs just like the ambience you get like kind of does the same work as like a, a a good song does in like another rpg that like characterizes the environment for you like i remember walking into like dark root garden for the first time and just like being washed over with like kind of the rushing of wind and like crickets and things like that that like really made a strong impression on me so um yeah that's just mine all right well i mean i i guess i've teased it a little bit uh th there's a couple optional things in the Anor Londo area that just made it, which is again, my favorite zone in the game by a, a significant margin that just made it um, much cooler for me. There, there's this whole like world within a world. If you go into the, uh, the, the chapel at the side of Anor Londo, there's a bunch of these, um, these white, uh, I, I forget what they're called. Are they, are they painting knights or uh, painted these, they're, they almost, they're almost ninja like these, um, these sort of white robed, uh, agile, uh, guards, um, um, in this chapel with a, with a painting at one end, a huge painting that takes up most of the wall. And if you approach the painting, you accidentally get drawn into it. Like you're playing Mario 64 or Castlevania portrait of ruin, um, which takes you to sort of the game's ice level, <laughs> a, uh, an abandoned fort called the, the, uh, painted world of Ariamis. And, uh, the story around here is really, really heartbreaking. It looks like that um, Gwyn had tried to uh, uh, create a human dragon hybrid um, with uh, possibly with Seath, the, the only again, the only dragon that uh, the, I should say the dragon that betrayed his own species to side with Gwyn, um, possibly with Seath's DNA, possibly with something else. But uh, uh, basically, this this land inside of a painting is the prison for a uh, a half dragon, half human named Priscilla. Who's um, who is is sort of a failed uh, magic experiment of sorts. Um, Priscilla had a uh, uh, had a set of caretakers um, in this painted world that I think have since passed away. So the uh, the 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 area is inha inhabited mostly by undead. And if you um, navigate the area, which is which has you know undead and and um, harpies and a bunch of and some keys and doors to figure out 
it's 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 a it's a it's a cool area to explore. There's also a, a rather unfortunate um mini catacomb full of wheel skeletons <laughs> that I didn't I didn't care for, frankly. Um if, if you get to her chamber at the end, she lets you exit because there's there's no way to leave the painted world under normal circumstances. Um or you can attack her to activate her as a boss fight. She's a uh, um she's invisible to the eye. You have to watch her uh, footprints in the ground or the snow to figure out where she is. Um, and she can counterattack with um, scythe moves that inflict a lot of bleed damage. I, I died to her a couple times before before figuring out uh, when to defend better. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a sad uh, area when you sort of understand the story happening around you because I mean, this is just a person whose very existence is suffering and... Uh, who wants nothing more than to be left alone, but you're sort of just like going into her, uh, into her prison unannounced. And uh, it's, I don't know, like it's kind of not as bad as the sea fight, but it's sort of tinged with tragedy in a way. But, but I, but I thought it was a cool area to check out for the first time. Any thoughts on the painted world? I, I, I definitely agree that it is visually very cool, but personally I found it to be a bit, um exasperating gameplay wise because um i think it's like the the hollows there they can like puke on you and that will inflict toxic actually instead of poison and toxic is like a much quick a much higher damage version of poison basically and those enemies are like littered all over the map and the the raven like harpies like the harpies with like the raven heads they're also very deadly and will pretty much three shot you unless you're Unless you go in with like very fully leveled gear, so I thought it was it was it was a very tough gauntlet. And as you mentioned before, the the basement full of bone wheels is the stuff of nightmares. And it is a uh, you, you will probably fall down there accidentally while you're playing. So like your death, like you you're not only are you disoriented from the fall, it's like you have to deal with like five bone wheels aggroing on you at the same time as well. I so I, I don't I think I felt that. I don't think I fell down accidentally, but I definitely climbed in there through a well because RPGs yeah. have taught me to search every well that I see. Oh um, yeah, that might be it. Yeah, but I re- <laughs> I just remember being like, okay, like I I I hit the floor, and then by the time I turn around, I see like three bone wheels charging me. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll die then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I just wanted gameplay wise to be a bit exasperating, but I definitely agree that visually it's a super cool area. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, some details I liked were like kind of the callbacks to Demon Souls. Like there were a few I I, I saw, like the the phalanx. Uh, they kind of brought those back, brought it back, but you know. It, yeah, the, the the yeah the the slime hoplite enemies yeah. that all gather to one. That, that that's the first boss of Demon Souls, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was the uh, the old monk king. I forget his name, old monk. And then, but like here, he's like a King Jeremiah. And like he has the same uh, weird turban thing, and like I don't know, I was, I was like, oh, th- this is nice and kind of nostalgic, and uh, and yeah, it's, it's it's generally a very interesting world that uh, I'm I'm curious uh, what some of the stuff means, like um, what like when you, there's like a big decaying dragon on the bridge towards the end. And then if you kill it, there's like another claw on the bridge. And I'm not sure what that is. Is it like another dragon? But you can't really get past it. And yeah, I just have a, there's like a whole bunch of unanswered questions about that world. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I I found it really interesting. It's one of my favorite worlds, even though I like Dom, I found it really annoying how the hollows can give you toxic. It's, yeah. Yeah, oh man, I forgot about those toxic inflicting undeads, but I, I think I had I know I gotten good enough at avoiding them by the end that they didn't bother me as much. Um uh I, I also went through the uh uh it, it, I think that this is a very easy place to farm experience because if you get to a level where you can one or two shot those the the, the phalanx slimes, you can get um eight thousand souls uh right next to a bonfire in about thirty seconds. Oh. And if you and if you wear um, uh, rings that increase your souls drops, that that number can go much higher. So towards the end of the game, when I was trying to um, 
build some equipment that cost uh, tens of thousands of souls. That that's where I went to get it, and I and one sort of running R one on my great scythe was able could kill <laughs> could one shot uh, maybe a couple slimes at once. So it's yeah, uh, that that's the kind of um, strategy this game uh, has you learn when you when it really gets its hooks into you. <laughs> Well, having that leveling hack is like actually super nice for the painted world because you're you're stuck there, right? Un- until you beat Priscilla. So if you correct, yeah, somehow end up going there like too early, like say you you go back to the undead asylum, get the doll, and like go there before you even beat Ornstein and Smau, like that's, oh, that's, that's right. going to be you so can't even, hard. You can't even get in there until you get the doll from uh, like from until you like jump into the raven's nest and go back to the asylum i forgot i forgot you're right yeah yeah it's like and, super and there's like, convoluted and there, just to get like, to that like, level and there's like three black knights on the way to the doll or something yeah yeah it's not easy uh once you get back to that uh asylum but yeah i mean like it, it's good that they have like that leveling fail safe for anybody who did happen to screw themselves over by getting there too early i, I was already f- like figuring out where to um like how to fight the the uh the the lord souls bosses when I did the painted world. So I, I got there at a manageable level, but Priscilla did take me a couple tries just because um, I, don't, I don't know. Like I, I bled out a few times in a row. <laughs> uh, but the other thing in an Orlando that really struck me as something that would be hard to do without um, preparation, but it's very, very cool when you pull it off is the entire quest line involving Gwendolyn. Um, you can meet Gwendolyn uh pretty early i think you i think you have to find uh the the dark moon ring in the catacombs which is in a hidden area in the catacombs um uh n- not not far from the uh uh from from that oh, who was that sad boss with the three masks pinwheel pinwheel that's right yeah it's not far from the pinwheel boss um and if you go take the dark moon ring to a sort of lower level of an arlando underneath the castle um, which has a bonfire there. It's it's not a very hard place to find. Um, then if you if you're wearing the ring when you go down there, uh, and, and there's plenty of player messages to to tell you what to do. Then um, a giant statue uh, dis- uh, disappears, exposing a new corridor, and that lets you join a new covenant. That's sort of like the secret society behind An Orlando that um, takes care of the enemies of An Orlando behind the scenes, and it's it's led by Gwendolyn who is King Gwyn's son and the younger brother of, uh, of Guinevere, the, um, the, the, the giant lady at the top of the castle. So, so, so that's cool. And the, um, and that, uh, that covenant, I think gets you bonuses for invading other people's, uh, uh, other people's world, similar to the forest hunters. And then, and that's neat. But if you, if you take a few extra steps, then things get very weird. Um, I mean, the easiest way to do this, there's probably a couple ways to do it. I think you can challenge Gwendolyn directly or you can find clues to this effect. But the easiest thing to do is just is to just use a range attack, a spell or an arrow, probably, um, and shoot Guinevere, the uh, um, the, the the goddess at the top of an Orlando. Um, if you do that, she instantly vanishes. Um, that's not the real Guinevere. Uh, that Guinevere was an illusion maintained by Gwendolyn because the the truth of the matter is is that um, all of the gods ab- abandoned an Orlando a long time ago, possibly centuries earlier, and uh, including Guinevere, including Guinevere's older brother that uh, sided with the dragons and is uh, and sort of became the uh, 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 the uh, aband- uh, was disowned by Gwen uh, when himself uh, re- retreated to where the first flame is and be- and became hollow, which which we uh, alluded to before. And Gwendolyn has been sort of maintaining this fake, this facade of control. It's like, no, 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 the, the, the gods of this world are still in power here. Everything's fine. When, and, uh, but, but if you shoot the, uh, the, the Guinevere illusion, the world darkens. The, I mean, the, the sun doesn't reach an Orlando anymore. And uh, most of the knights that you uh, encounter across the game are now gone. Uh, really, most of those knights were illusions and just a, a handful of Gwendolyn's most trusted knights are the, uh, r- replace them. Um, the firekeeper near the beginning of an Orlando is is still there. She's one of Gwendolyn's agents, but uh, y- yeah, it sort of all crumbles around you, and then you can fight um, Gwendolyn in the same corridor where you meet him. The boss fight's a little annoying. You have to sort of like follow him down an endless corridor 
dodge or block his attacks, getting like one hit in, and then he teleports further down. It's a it's a little repetitive, but it's not a terrible boss fight, I guess. But if you defeat Gwendolyn, forge some of his armor, uh, read some more clues, read some more item descriptions. And it it, it reveals a, like a family story that's way more screwed up than than even I assumed going in. Um, because Gwendolyn was born with sort of moon powers instead of sun powers, moon powers are considered inferior and feminine. So Gwendolyn, who is biologically male, was raised as a woman and has some major, major issues with, uh, with, 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 um, with gender identity and, um, and abuse from Gwen himself. And it's, a uh, it, it's just a very, very sad, strange story. That's a little bit too much like the B horror movie sleepaway camp for my liking. If you know, if you know, you know, uh, but, uh, yeah, that was, I mean, I, I thought when I, I, I did not, in, uh, encounter this organically, I, I read about it and then used the, the very, very end of the game when I was basically ready to fight Gwen to, uh, to, sh- to darken and Orlando. I, I also used this opportunity to, uh, to kill both the, um, <laughs> both the firekeeper in in Orlando and the spider woman in, uh, in, in blight town to, to pump up my, uh, my Estes flask a little bit. <laughs> So I, I I killed a couple extra fire keepers, <laughs> um, perhaps unnecessarily just for the end game. But uh, yeah, well, what do we think about the like Anne Orlando's dark secret? Yeah, I, I love thinking uh, of the first player that was just like got to Guinevere, decided to screw around and just like shot an arrow at her and then like watched the sun just disappear and Anne Orlando sink into darkness. Because I mean, like the first thing you see when you when you get to Anne Orlando is just like, the the power of the sun just like projecting directly on the camera you get like a a lens flare kind of effect and it's just like it makes that city look so like impressive and like a beacon of hope compared to like everything you've seen before so to have that all like just like vanish like that's another reason that uh it makes Cotswold conspiracy a little a little more appealing to buy into because like everybody is getting bamboozled by by Gwyn and, and the gods I mean, it's an amazing sort of symptom of, of this of this world being dying and abandoned and 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 derelict. Uh, and but it's I mean, I I, I thought I thought it was so cool. Like I uh, I I'm glad I waited till the end to do it because I I mean I I still like the shiny version of Anna Orlando, but uh, yeah, it's 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 cool as hell. Well, well, anyway, sort of that's how my end game went. Uh, I I uh, I sort of. I got the Lord Souls. I did most of what I wanted to do. I killed two uh um uh two fire keepers to make my SS flash stronger. But but then I decided to go to the DLC. And this um Artorius of the Abyss DLC uh landed uh I think a little less than a year after the game came out. Um in a a, a very, very fun version of subversive marketing. Basically, I think my understanding is people that had paid for the DLC, or if you had the PC version or the later remastered version, um uh, it automatically came with the DLC. You you had to like fight a crystal golem in a really remote part of the dark root basin, then uh, speak to the um, mysterious woman that appears, then go back all the way to the Duke's archives and kill the crystal golem that's that's already there, like even in the un unpatched version of the game. Then after you defeat that crystal golem, you get an item, and if you go back to where the 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 lady in the lake was with that first crystal golem, you get drawn and dragged into a portal. Uh, leading to the DLC zone, uh, which is a a very very picturesque sort of forest and shrine, and then sort of a uh, uh, I would say sort of like a, a city complex that that goes um uh, uh, vertically down. Um, th- there's a couple boss fights on the way, and we'll talk about those. But uh, it, it, w- what it, what I think becomes clear is that this was a, a a a time portal to the past, where you're confronting sort of the aftermath of the famous Ar- uh, uh, Artorius. And Artorius is, was a knight of Gwyn that was like Gwyn's uh, finest soldier who uh, uh, braved the abyss to, um, to, to, to challenge it and, um, and, and save the, uh, uh, I, I think save the princess of a, of a neighboring nation or something. Yeah. So Ulysseel is the region that you go to in the right. past. And Ulysseel is, was the first place that was being attacked by the abyss. So the abyss is already in Lordran at the time that you're um, 
you know, going around. And that's why New Londo was flooded to sequester the abyss um, with the four kings and everything. But um, originally the, the the source of the abyss was in Ulysil. And so um, Gwyn sent his four um, knights, or I guess, I guess it was just three of them, because I think um, uh, Ornstein is one of them. But there's also um, Gouge um, and then Artorius and then Ciaran. And those three are all in this DLC. Um, so he sent them there to like basically figure out what's going on and, and push back the abyss. Right. And um, and we, we mentioned this earlier, but uh, so, sort of going into the abyss, uh, uh, like, like we even encounter Seif, uh, uh, Artorius's wolf friend, and we, we can uh, save her from what appears to be a barrier given by um, like uh, present like a, a barrier established by Artorius himself to save her. Yeah. He uh, left his great shield because he was injured in the battle with Manus. So right. he can't use it anymore. So he left it behind to protect uh Seif. Yeah. And I picked up that great shield and used it against Manus because it has <laughs> by far the best magic reduction of any shield I have. I had available. And then Manus has a big magic attack that killed me um, very quickly the first time I fought him. Uh, but but uh, and uh, but but anyway, the run of bosses here. Um, there's the sanctuary guardian at the beginning. Then around halfway through, you fight uh, you, you you fight Artorius of the Abyss, who's again again this a uh, a humanoid knight that's been corrupted by the darkness of the Abyss. Um, you can optionally fight a giant dragon called Calamit. And then at the end of the Abyss zone, there's a uh, um, th- there's a uh, Manus the sort of dark god of the abyss and i mean top to bottom i think those are four of probably the best eight fights in the whole game like they're 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 intense and fast and awesome artorius is probably my favorite boss fight other than ornstein and smile those are the those are 1a and 1b um and and i just had a, a lot of fun with this dlc zone because it really felt like it it, it felt beautiful and crafted kind of like the best parts of the first half of dark souls. And, um, it was a joy to explore and, uh, and do these cool boss fights. But, but because I waited till the very end game to do it, I was pretty well kitted out and my, uh, and my build was sort of established by then. So any, any souls I got were just, were just went straight to vitality. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I thought this DLC was great, and I th- find it very, very hilarious that it was sneakily put into the game. And the, the my understanding is the community lost their damn minds for about forty eight hours before it was de- um, it was discovered, and then and then widely spread around uh, how how to access so it. It's actually they said ahead of time how to access it. That's oh. it. It's interesting. So that was like a that's kind of a myth that's propagated. Oh, in the community. so okay. So it's an apocryphal story that I encountered. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a I forget which um, Souls YouTuber did a video about it, but uh, one of them recently did a video and they went back and like looked at all the press releases and all that and like yeah, they just told you how to access it. Uh, Bandai Namco did um, at the time <laughs> it came out because they knew like nobody is gonna just figure that out on their own. Um, well, th- so, yeah. that, that's a little disappointing, but probably <laughs> the, probably the best in the long run, uh, because <laughs> because I, I imagine there could have been a, a negative backlash. But uh, I mean, that doesn't diminish how good the DLC is. Again, these are, mm-hmm. I think, four of the better boss fights of, in the game, mm-hmm. and it, it allows you to experience part of the Artoria story, which is one of the cooler, you know, background pieces to Dark Souls, Dark, to Dark Souls lore. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I loved it, but I, I was playing the remastered version of the game, so I didn't have to bend over backwards to play it but uh yeah it's great yeah one other thing too like lore wise um in this dlc is that um so if you notice there's especially when you're going down towards manis and the more um abyss like corrupted areas of the of the the dlc um there's these enemies that are basically like physical like sentient representations of like the humanity that you are always consuming um like the humanity items and so it there is kind of like like we were talking about earlier with like is Koth like um, you know trying to trick you in in how you know is that really like the evil path or not? But it's interesting that the the abyss and the creatures, some of the creatures of the abyss are these like humanity creatures. So it's almost like 
the humanity is tied to the abyss in some way. And so, you know, it's kind of implying something about like the humanity that you're using, but also like human humanity's relationship to the abyss and the darkness versus the gods and the age of fire and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and like, I think, um, I did the, the DLC is the reason why I like, I never take, <clears throat> I never do, um, dark stalker costs route anymore because, um, dark stalker Koth pretty much the Lord, the entire reason, um, the abyss is going buck wild in Ula Seal is because um Koth convinced the people of Ula Seal to dig up Manus's Manus's grave mm -hmm. and steal the pendant, I think. And that is and Manus is a he's a primeval man who had a very powerful shard of humanity. And by digging up his grave, they basically reawakened him and his and Manus's humanity ended up becoming like the abyss of that time so koth pretty much he, he screwed up an entire country just almost just for just to see what happens really by digging up the grave so i that's why i'd never take koth's route anymore because <laughs> i just it, i just can't honestly he he does he he's also the reason the new launder is underwater because he tempted the four kings with um life drain which is like a forbidden power i think back then and because of that, they eventually ended up falling to the corruption of the abyss, which is why New Londa is flooded at the start of the game. So, yeah, lots of interesting lore tidbits there. Yeah. Um, for me, sorry, like I, I wanted to go back to Artorias because like, um, my, like my thought when I was fighting him was like, oh, he kind of moves like, um he's kind of like the first boss to kind of move like this i don't like other bosses like kind of have uh they're the way they like the way you read their attacks is like a lot simpler in the game but artorius is the first one to like kind of um have a more interesting move set that kind of um is that kind of became the template for uh how future games enemies would kind of work and yeah, Ar Ar Artorius and Manus feel like uh, Bloodborne bosses back mm -hmm. that that went back in time into Dark Souls One. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, yeah. They, they, they 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 just move with more. They move with more energy, and they're they're much faster. Uh, their mo their uh, big attacks are all telegraphed, but they're just you know big and fast. And uh, oh, I mean, it, it, like. Like Ornstein and Smau, they sort of they'll, they'll, they'll sort of like take turns attacking and move in a very linear but still powerful way. Like the, these, they, they they like circle you, they stalk you, and um and and their attacks will be more unexpected and flashier. It's it, it feels like a later series boss. Yeah, the modern like from soft boss template it really comes out of this DLC. Like you can, you can really see like the connection between like Artorius and Manus. And then a lot of the like more famous or memorable fights um, in like Dark Souls three, um, even Dark Souls two, to some extent, Bloodborne and even Elden Ring. Um, they're like the very aggressive move sets, the like complex combo strings. I think a lot of the bosses in Demon Souls and then in base game, Dark Souls are a lot more like, it's a big enemy and they do like maybe one or two attacks with like a lot of wind up and they're not as fast and it's more like traditional, I guess you would say boss design. And these bosses are much more like a duel between you and like a slightly larger and slightly more powerful um, foe. Uh, and I think that's just like where, how they would design bosses from here on out. Yeah. It's also just a, a huge step forward and like, like characterization of bosses like through mm -hmm. animation because like yeah like or Ornstein and Smau are like that's a great boss but like their attacks just like feel very rigid and video gamey but like the way Artorius moves like you can like feel that like corruption and pain that like he's experiencing from the abyss like just in the way like he moves around and does his attacks and and that's what yeah the series like really started to excel at starting with Bloodborne is just like giving a sense of like who the boss is through like the detail and the animation. Yeah. I mean, no arguments here. The, the, these boss fights are great and are a portent for what the series boss fights would be like later on. And 
I don't think any of us are complaining. It's it, it's super good. But I mean, I, I mean, to, just to put a bow on it, Dark Souls One is super good. Like it, it like on, on the surface, it's this extremely cool action RPG that has this this interconnected setting and good boss fights and 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 a lot of and a lot of threat that you can conquer with patience and persistence. But this um minimalist story that gives way into extraordinarily deep and cool lore. I mean, I, uh, I, I had been putting, putting off playing this game for well over a decade, but I'm so glad I finally did. Uh, I, I just, I just wish that, um, maybe it didn't have such a, uh, a, a, a nasty reputation for difficulty. Cause I know there's people on RPG fan that haven't played these games because of that reputation. And I'm like, and I'm, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, these are hard, but it's not, it, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not like NES Ninja Turtles hard. It's a, it's a it's a do, it's a doable hard, and I just I, I was so impressed. This, this game is great. Do we have any other final comments before we move on to the to housekeeping? Um. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, for me, um, as someone who started with the PS3 version and then and with this most recent playthrough, I played remastered. Um, well, sixty FPS makes a big difference. Um, I can't say I'm a big fan of some of the lighting changes, though. Um, I think a lot of aura was lost. But if you, if it's if remastered is your, your first time playing it, I think um, you you wouldn't really mind, and it's it's totally fine. Um, I would recommend like someone maybe pick up the Prepare to Die edition on PC or something because. Um, I don't know the way the li- lighting works there. Little subtle changes to the aesthetic are, uh, they're, they're great. Like I just I I kind of prefer them. So yeah. But um, no matter what version you play, Dark Souls is really one of the best games of all time. Um, I would say, and uh, really well worth experiencing if 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 uh if you could let go of like your fear of souls or like, if you think it's too hard. It's not. Um, Dark Souls kind of uh helps you out it, it it's a fair it's a fair game i would say so yeah i would heartily recommend it to anyone you can also play um the 360 version is backwards compatible if you have an xbox so um yeah. that version will keep retain the like art design and everything of the original um it's not at 60 the, frames per second the, but I think the, the much the much more pukey greens of the original version <laughs> Yeah, and it it'll I think it it has more like um, steady performance, so you don't get as much frame drops and like bite town mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it's like you know like a idealized version of the original version if you if you don't like um, the remastered version. I remember as Miyazaki much. even saying that like he meant for his games to be played in 30 fps oh my god so if you want to stay if you want to stay true to miyazaki's vision that's the way to do it yeah i mean they did tie like game logic to uh frame rate so that's that's probably part of what he means with that yeah yeah (laughs) because like your (laughs) weapons degrade at like if you run it in 60 fps they degrade at like twice the rate and stuff like that um but there are fixes for that on pc um and then obviously the remastered version fixes that stuff too. Yeah, I mean, I would say Dark Souls is like it's it's punishing in a sense, but I think it's it sort of just lends itself like the the difficulty I think just is sort of um just trying to impress like like um how should I say this? Like trying to make the world feel as real as possible. For instance, like when when like the the Black Knight not the black knight like the big chunky knight in the undead parish when he like clobbers me with his mace like i kind of expect like it, it doesn't surprise me when i see like 80 percent of my health bar fly off when he like um hits me with a mace there or when maybe i get careless and i get cornered by like three undead and they like all end up skewering me with their spears but, like if you if you just slow down and you realize that the enemies can basically like do as much damage as you do and they and you're just not given as many guardrails perhaps as um other games like guard dark souls is like a pretty like a more than doable game and especially like if you go into some of the like you go into some like the 
builds kind of with like with shields or with like ranged magic it becomes like a i think it becomes like even a fairly easy game to play honestly because something like magic in this game is really overpowered for most bosses and like there there's there there's um they're like difficulty sliders but they're like in game and like they're dependent on like maybe the build choices you go with or how you decide to spec out your character in the early game so yeah i say i say it's like it's i wouldn't say it's particularly more difficult than a lot of other games out there it's just that the options to tune the difficulty are just present in the game rather than in like an options menu yeah, the, the the game's hard, but I mean, it, it really does reward patience and uh, and 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 effort. Because I mean, I mean, you 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 can you can figure out a build that works, and and often find exactly the item you need just by exploring a little bit further. But I mean, I mean, mm-hmm. it's it has a it has this reputation for being ultra hard. I mean, the Dark Souls of Blank was practically a meme for several years that we even propagated on RPG fan podcasts. Uh, and uh, that I, I and and the community around it has become this sort of like a, a, a mix of a genuinely good community with some uh, nasty get good te- toxicity that mm-hmm. I don't I don't think helped anything. So um, I, I don't want to meditate too much on like is on, on how hard these games how necessary it is that these games be hard be because i i think the difficulty is real but it's not the kind of difficulty that should prevent people from playing the game like i i think this game is so cool and uh and really one of the best rpgs of its specific era that it's a uh, unless you truly cannot handle a, a 3d action rpg then it i i strongly recommend it that this game is just a Top to bottom, this game's great. I recommend it. If you if you are the kind of person that would listen to three hours of podcasts about Dark Souls without having played it. <laughs> um, but you know, maybe we uh I, I spent quite a long time um playing Dark Souls in uh mostly in the month of June. I think I should uh y- you know, maybe follow up with a different kind of dark fantasy RPG. Um right now I'm in the middle of playing Dragon Age Inquisition. And we're then, and that's because we're doing two episodes on Dragon Age Inquisition in uh in, in August. Uh, I am s- way too deep into that game, and I'm very excited to talk about it in a couple of weeks, possibly with uh w- with some present company as well. Uh, but uh, but also um coming to Retro Encounter in August, we're doing one episode on Undertale next week. Um, the orig- our first Undertale episode from a few years ago has some technical issues, and there's also several years of perspective and new staff. Excited to talk about, or I should say, um, new um, post-2020 staff. Excited to talk about it. So we're doing a revisit on Undertale next week. And also one episode about Final Fantasy games that I'm not exactly going to reveal the true nature of right now. And one episode on DLC in which, in which uh, From Software games might make multiple appearances so that's the future of uh retro encounter but retro encounter is not the only podcast on rpgfan.com there's also random encounter every two weeks about what games we're playing and uh rhythm encounter about uh every other two weeks about rpg music you can uh support rpg fan by listening to our podcasts emailing retro at rpgfan.com following rpg fan on facebook instagram threads twitter twitch youtube uh discord a whole a whole bunch of places there's even a shop rpgfan.com slash shop which has two storefronts one hosted by t public where you can get apparel and uh accessories like coffee mugs and phone cases and another hosted by Har- hyperplay rpg where you can buy the rpg fan reviews compilation a 300 page tome uh containing single page reviews from all of rpg fans history uh and i i mentioned those other podcasts you can review any podcast on the rpg fan podcast network on apple podcasts or youtube or spotify uh, by clicking like buttons subscribing five stars out of five you know the deal please give us feedback in any way you choose um but yeah that, that was a, a big rambling into the housekeeping portion of the podcast frankly because i'm just starting to fade a little bit uh <laughs> but uh i mean the, the dark souls has a reputation for being an ordeal, but I had so much fun with it and was so excited to talk about it that this this uh, podcast was not an ordeal for me at all, as at least uh, not mental, mentally or emotionally. So thank you so much, Alex, Ben, Gio, and Dom um, for uh, for agreeing to take part in these episodes. Um, yeah, Dark Souls is great. How about it? It sure is.
one of the best best one <laughs> yeah i think it might be the best one although i feel i have very strong feelings about dark souls 2 um so it's one of those for me <laughs> i mean i've only played three from souls games i i think bloodborne is my favorite between dark souls bloodborne and demon souls but uh i'm i'm perfectly i i think i, I probably will end up replaying uh at least a couple of these to because they're that good uh, although i am side um looking real hard at my copies of dark souls 2 and 3 right now and wondering which one's next um but oh, is, there, is there a recommendation or should we uh, keep moving on no no i sorry i wanted to say that um uh, i want to correct myself because i forgot about bloodborne but yeah that's my favorite too <laughs> with these solo <laughs> so and I mean, I've heard that there's this little indie darling Elden Ring that a lot of people like. Maybe that maybe that one is uh, high on people's lists as well. But uh, if, if you want to share with us your soul's opinions or uh, tell me about your Dragon Age build or um, uh, or which Final Fantasy game we, um, is the best, whatever you want, uh, you should reach out to us as individuals and not just as a podcast. Uh, let's tell the listeners how to find us, the panelists, starting with you, Dom. Oh, you kind of ping me on discord on the rpg fan server as at dh candy now ben uh you can email me at ben logan love at gmail.com now geo yeah you can email me at uh, geo at rpg fan.com or you can reach out through discord i go by uh, at 10 b star t-e-n-b-i star now alex you can email me at alex franichek at gmail.com and listeners maybe you've heard me say this uh upwards of 200 times but uh you can find me online in a couple places pretty easily i am at evoger for dogs on blue sky instagram and rpg fans discord i am no longer on a certain bird site and i thank god for that every day but also i mean we don't know what the game after uh after shadow of the earth tree is do we well we'll we'll see what tokyo game show can bring um thank god for uh hidetaka miyazaki Thank you, good night, and good luck.